I don't think we're at a real risk of a real recession like a 2008, like a pandemic or anything like that. As those supply chains open up, as those bottlenecks open up, prices continue to come down, which affects top line, which affects GDP, which could, could you know, which could perceive slowing growth. But I don't see a real recession like we saw 2008-9 uh, anytime soon. We're getting an update on the real estate market and the housing markets with Greg Dickerson, real estate investor, entrepreneur. He's an expert on the real estate markets, and we'll be talking about the latest data and trends. Welcome back to the show, Greg. It's been a long time. Uh, people can check out our interview from the from the last time you were on the show, which has been almost a year now. Time flies, but happy to have you back on. Thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, a year ago it goes by quick, especially in the real estate market. You know, it's a it's a slow moving freight train, that's for sure. Well, before we talk about uh, what's next and your outlook and the current data, how would you evaluate the performance of real estate over the last twelve months? Has it been uh, moving along at the same pace as uh, what you would expect, concurrent with the rest of the economic growth and other macroeconomic drivers? Yeah, things are kind of progressing. You know. Pretty much as we discussed in the last interview. So you got to separate the residential housing market from the commercial market. So the commercial real estate market continues to be under stress. We're seeing a lot of assets go back to the banks. We're seeing foreclosures and defaults on the rise. Even in really good markets like Manhattan, Washington, D.C., you're seeing assets uh, being sold for 50, 60, 70 percent of what they uh, what they sold for, you know, three, four, five, ten years ago. So it's really interesting what's going on in the commercial real estate market. The housing market is, you know, in, in all markets, commercial, residential, you know, real estate's hyper local. So every market's different, every asset in every market's different. Uh, but in general, the housing market has remained, you know, resilient, robust. There's still a shortage of units. Uh, there's still a lot of demand, pent up demand for housing. Uh, there's houses that are still selling for days with multiple offers and in a lot of markets, you know, houses that are in good shape, that are priced well. And then there's markets where inventories are at uh, pre-pandemic levels, uh, you know, like Austin, Texas, you know, some other areas of Texas, some areas, uh, you know, in the southeast, Miami starting to take a little bit of a hit. Condo markets under a lot of pressure there. So it's really interesting. There are certain markets that are still, you know, uh, extremely red hot. And then there's other markets that are cooling off and we're seeing inventory levels climb. We're seeing values drop, things like that. But overall, when you look at the average, it's still a very undersupplied market with a lot of pressure. I want to come back to a commercial real estate and some of the risks there. Uh, let's talk about today's data. So on the uh, on the 22nd of August, uh, the latest uh, new home sales data came out. Um U.S. existing home sales rose more than expected in July, reversing four consecutive monthly declines, improving supply and demand, uh, and declining mortgage rates offered hope that activity could rebound in the months ahead. I'm reading a Reuters article here. Home sales rose 1.3% last month to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 3.95 million units. Uh, the consensus ex uh, expectation, um, according to polls, was 3.93 million units, so slightly beating expectations. Are we seeing an uptrend now, a pickup in home sales? Is that the new trend? So um, a lot of that data comes from contracts back in probably April, May, because it takes six, you know, 30, 60, 90 days for a lot of these properties to close. So this isn't like what happened in July or June. It's probably older data than that. But yeah, with interest rates coming down, we've seen the 10-year under pressure. Um, you know, that's brought interest rates down. And whenever you start seeing a decline in interest rates, you see a surge in purchase applications, you see a surge in refinance applications. So we're seeing, you know, upward, uh, you know, traction on inventory, which is increasing sales, uh, which is going to add to those numbers, but still nowhere where we need to be north of, you know, four and a half, five million. You know, that's kind of what's typical uh, in terms of sales per year. Uh, so we're getting close. Home resales, it says here, home resales, which account for a large portion of U.S. housing sales, declined 2.5% on a year-on-year -year basis in July. The median existing home price jumped 4.2% from a year earlier to $422,600. Uh, well, $422, home prices increased in all four U.S. regions. Um, so yeah, tell us about home, home resales versus um, uh, new home sales. Yeah, two very different markets. You know, permits are down, uh, builders are pulling back, uh, resales are up because uh, as interest rates drop, those sellers that are, you know, kind of locked in and need to move, have to move, want to move, they're able to, um, you know, mobilize a little bit now. So you know, the, re the existing sales market almost always uh, outperforms the new market just because of 
uh, you know, inventory levels and the ability to deliver new units. Home builders can't build fast enough for the demand, and they've learned that they can be more profitable building less houses uh, than, you know, ramping up production. And even if they wanted to ramp up production, we don't have the labor force to do it. So, you know, it's it's really, really interesting, you know, how those two dynamics versus like a 2008-9 timeframe where, you know, new construction probably outpaced resales uh, at one point there. And we just built that huge, huge inventory that took almost 10 years to work through. Before we continue with the interview, I want to tell you about another way you can invest your Bitcoins and store them safely instead of using a traditional wallet or an exchange. Consider an IRA. Today's sponsor, iTrust Capital, is one such IRA that offers 35 crypto assets and the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1% only. And being an IRA, it also offers unique tax benefits. If you'd like to get started and learn more, click on itrust.capital slash David in the link down below or scan the QR code up here. If you're over 18 and you want to open a new account with cash or roll over an existing account, you can do so using my referral link. And if you use that referral link, you'll get $100 in signing bonuses. Well, let's talk about that, the new versus existing home sales markets. Is there a supply glut right now, do you think, in most markets? So there's there's more, yeah, there's more um, resales on the market in most areas than there is new construction. Um I think right now, and you know that that balance is starting to come down. Builders are pulling back a little bit just because the you know interest rates, uh, you know seasonality plays into it as well. You know sales always drop a little bit in the summer months, so it'll be interesting to see how those numbers kind of phase out over the next few months. But um, you know we are still undersupplied in most markets, but you're seeing again like in Austin, Texas, where resales is driving the bulk of the listings, uh, you know, the existing home markets driving the bulk of the listings in that market versus new construction. But there are some markets where new construction probably overtakes uh, existing home supply. So it's it's very hyper local. On a national average, there's probably more resales on the market than there are new construction right now. Uh, Greg, let's talk about um, the upcoming Fed pivot. So the Fed is expected by market consensus to lower rates starting September. They even announced in their latest uh, Fed minutes from uh, July that a September rate cut would be likely. They use the word likely. How is this going to impact number one, mortgage rates? Number two, ultimately demand. So, you know, the Fed cannot do anything about the housing market. So the Fed interest rate uh, cut that's contemplated uh, coming in September, hopefully we'll get some guidance on that when Powell speaks at Jackson Hole upcoming. But, um, you know, that affects the commercial uh, real estate rate market, that affects consumer credit rates and except you know it affects the automobile rates you know commercial credit rates it doesn't affect residential mortgage rates those are loosely based on the 10-year treasury note which is where longer term investors look for yield so that's where you know you see 10-year come down you see mortgage rates come down which is what we've seen lately 10-year goes up mortgage rates spike so there's really nothing the fed can do to affect the housing market you could argue that if interest rates come down, then that, that affects the uh, ability of a builder to borrow because they're borrowing from commercial credit lines, you know, to build houses and things like that. But it does not affect the rate of a borrower who's buying a house at the end of the day. So there's that's really not going to affect demand at all. I think what that will do will take a little bit of pressure off the consumer. We're seeing credit card balances rise. We're seeing, you know, the, the interest rates on credit cards went up, car loan interest rates went up. Uh, you know, where we're seeing a recession right now is obviously in automobiles, durable goods, and in the housing market. But the only thing the Fed can do is really affect that commercial credit rate. Okay, but suppose mortgage rates do fall, and I've gotten some estimates that uh, perhaps they'll start to, uh, at the very least, not go up from here. Maybe we'll see a plateau for a bit. Um, would that be enough to incentivize, would a slight tick down in mortgage rates be enough to incentivize new people from going into the market? That's what we're that's the thinking. So the thinking is it would do two things. Number one, it would it would free up a little bit of inventory because sellers who are kind of locked in as the rates come down, now it makes sense for them to go ahead and sell a house, realize that equity, and then go buy another house. So every seller is a consumer of a housing unit, either a buyer or a renter. Uh, so you know it's kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing. You need the inventory for somebody to sell. You need somebody to sell to create the inventory. So the thinking is lower interest rates will spur more inventory, which frees up the you know people on the sidelines that are looking to buy. And right now it's cheaper to rent than it is to buy. A lot of millennials are locked out of housing and you know they're really frustrated by it. Gen Z and millennials that are looking, you know, they can't afford a house. As rates come down, the affordability, you know, uh, 
uh, index comes down uh, along with it because people are buying payments for the most part. Uh, but that could continue that increased demand to put pressure because we don't have a lot of inventory on those uh, units that come to the market. So it could be kind of a you know double-edged sword there. Well, I, I think the other um, indirect impact of a Fed cut is that it historically Fed, the Fed cuts during or into a recession. I'm not saying there will be a recession. I'll get your outlook on that. Uh, but suppose there is some sort of economic slowdown. Well, a Fed cut would basically indirectly imply that there's going to be a slowdown in demand for for housing. Would there not be? I, you know, so let's define recession. So a lot of people think recession is 2008-9, right? They, they think that's what a recession is, which which it was. You know, 2008-9 was a real recession. You had real job loss. You had real decline in GDP. Whereas a recession and the pandemic, you know, that was a forced recession. Businesses closed. We saw GDP fall through the, fall through the floor there. What we could potentially see and what we are seeing, again, we've got a recession in housing because transactions are down, you know, activities down, things like that. You've got a recession in automobiles. Uh, car market is, you know, under a lot of pressure right now because of the cost of vehicles and interest rates. And you're seeing durable goods, Home Depot, Lowe's. You know, you've seen their reports lately in terms of people pulling back on spending. So you've got, you know, builders are pulling back. Remodeling is down. Um you know, construction is down in multifamily. So you've got three things that are affecting a potential slowdown and job loss, but we're not seeing job loss in the construction industry, which typically leads a recession. Housing market, you know, recession and construction industry jobs typically lead a recession. So the Fed, I think you're going to hear from Powell, thinks that they've got this thing nailed. They think they're, they've got the perfect landing because the economy is still strong. I mean, we've got a thirty trillion dollar GDP. Twenty eight trillion dollars of that is earned income. Um, you know, the consumer is strong. They're still spending. They're coming under pressure. The people that have money have money and are spending it. The people that don't are under the most pressure. So, for a real recession to happen, people have to lose their jobs. And as you see, the unemployment rate is still relatively low, even with the revisions on jobs. We still created you know over hundred thousand uh, dollars, hundred thousand jobs a month, one fifty, one seventy five, whatever that is. So. The economy is still creating jobs. There's still a lot of people that aren't counted, that are self-employed, people like you. You're not counted in anything anywhere, right? So there's a lot of self-employed people, a lot of gig workers. You know, That whole economy is not quantified when you're looking at job loss, job creation, things like that. You create a lot of jobs. They might be internationally, but you create a lot of jobs through what you do. So as far as I'm concerned, I think what the Fed is seeing is that the economy is robust. They can, you know, lower interest rates because they see policy as restrictive right now. And in certain instances and circumstances, it is. People look at the stock market, all-time highs, this, that, and the other, and they think, you know, there's a disconnect between that and what's going on in the real economy. But, you know, I don't think we're at a real risk of a real recession like a 2008, like a pandemic or anything like that. I think you could see a slowdown, which we are seeing in certain sectors, which which could overall affect GDP as prices come down, that's going to affect growth and sales numbers, right? That are reported in GDP. A lot of the growth that we've seen is because of, you know, inflation. But, you know, as those supply chains open up, as those bottlenecks open up, prices continue to come down, which affects top line, which affects GDP, which could, could, you know, which could perceive slowing growth. But I don't see a real recession like we saw 2008-9 uh, anytime soon. Well, you sent me some stats um, offline. So let's talk about um, a housing marsh crash update, uh, housing market crash update, rather. Um, basically, are you concerned about a housing crash uh, given consumer stats? Are we seeing more foreclosures? Are we seeing more delinquencies and people falling behind on mortgage payments? Are, are people falling behind rent? How are people's credit scores evolving? Let, let's give an update here. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as far as rents go, rents are still strong. Uh, We saw rents decline a little bit, but they're starting to, you know, tick up a little bit in a lot of markets because that inventory is is getting absorbed. So we're seeing rent stabilize, occupancy stabilize. That's in single family and multifamily. I'm not concerned about a housing crash. We've seen, again, the housing is in a recession because transactions are down. So we've seen a crash in transactions, but not in values and not in terms of foreclosures. I mean, right now, um, in terms of, you know, just from just some general things, uh, I think, uh, you know, you just have to look at the health of the borrower. So the borrowers have, you know, record high credit scores, you know, 86% of the outstanding mortgage debt has a rate lower than 6%, 61% is under four, 21% 
uh, you know, is, is over 5%. So you've got a very healthy borrower with a very low interest rate. Um, 80% of the borrowers, like I said, are, are well qualified. 40% of the homes out there are owned free and clear. And let's talk about the home market. So there's 100 million single family homes, plus or minus, you know, at a value of $45 trillion. You know, right now there's about a million of them for sale. Typically you'd have about 4 million uh, for sale at any given time, you know, and that really spiked back in 08, 09. You know, around, there's around 100,000 foreclosures, you know, every year. Um, you know, there were 3 million in 2008 each year, 2009, 2010. Um, you know, there's about $12.4 trillion owed on 84 million mortgages. Uh, and then, like I said, 40% of homes, you know, the housing stocks owned free and clear. You know, and as far as, you know, foreclosure rates and defaults, I mean, those are running at record lows as well. So we're seeing an uptick, a little bit of an uptick, but you're, you're just coming off of record, record low levels of mortgage defaults out there and, and you know, distress in, in yeah. the residential market. And just to uh, illustrate your point here, this is a report dating, um, well, Q1, uh, but um, according to Adam here, foreclosures were up 3% from the previous month in, uh, in March 2024, but down 4% from March 2023. So, yeah, like you said, um, not a significant uh, pickup at all there. Uh, this is from uh, the latest uh, housing uh, starts um, uh, statistics here from the Census Bureau. So you can see here this downtrend in both permits and starts. Is that a leading indicator for anything? Well, you know, when you say leading indicator, again, you know, builders have pulled back and are pulling back just because, uh, especially, so multifamily is mixed in there, um, as well as single family. Multifamily is really pulled back because there's been an oversupply. And, you know, single family, the issues there are interest rates. So as interest rates rise, builders pull back. As interest rates fall, builders ramp up. Builders are the most efficient sellers in the market. They learned their lesson in 08, 09. So they're going to kind of follow interest rates. So that could be a leading indicator of interest rates. Um, you know, so as, you know, starts come down, that tells you interest rates were high. As interest rates come down, starts will, you know, start to increase a little bit. Some of it's seasonality, you know, sometimes you'll see a little bit of a slowdown in the summer months, you know, in sales and in starts. But, you know, uh, and a lot of markets, again, are under pressure. There's a lot of markets where builders overbuilt a little bit. Um, and they're having to, you know, give away some incentives, buy down interest rates, things like that to get inventory off the books in certain markets. So, you know, a lot of these builders are national. So they're looking at, hey, we're oversupplied here in this market. So let's pull back over here until we get some of this stuff sold. And again, they're going to build fewer units for more money at a higher profit margin. So it's in, it's in their best interest, you know, to kind of keep those starts down. But yeah, we've seen we've seen you know demand fall through the floor because of interest rates. So that that is reflecting a little bit of that demand. So ultimately, for the residential side, do you see us entering a buyer's or a seller's market into next year? It's it's neither neither nor. So every market's different. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's it's neither nor. Sellers are still stubborn. Sellers are still looking at those numbers. You know, we saw ten years of appreciation from you know twenty twenty till now. So over the last four years, we've seen ten years of appreciation in housing. Some markets and some properties in some markets are back below pre-pandemic level and you're seeing big price adjustments, but a lot of sellers, you know, still have that housing frenzy of 2022, 2023 in their minds when interest rates were, you know, two and 3%, which is what really drove that demand and frenzy where you had lines of a hundred people outside, you know, going to an open house. I mean, that, that stuff was real. So now, you know, you, you're hearing agents, uh, talk about no sh no showings with open houses. You know, they're not getting offers. Houses are sitting on the market longer. Uh, but then there's other markets where, again, you know, it's a bidding war. You get multiple offers and houses are selling a day. So it really depends on the market. But on the national average, it's neither or. Sellers are adjusting. Buyers are adjusting. As interest rates come down, that will give buyers the ability to start making a move. So, you know, it, it could turn more into a seller's market as interest rates come down because buyers will have the ability to, you know, afford the payments. So if I own a home, if I already am an existing homeowner and I and I want to either um, upgrade or just want to sell my property um, for whatever reason, should I wait for interest rates to come down a bit more? Yeah, I think you'll get more for your house as rates drop because in, that demand should increase. And again, you need to be in good condition, well priced, you know, well maintained. So you know you want to make sure that you show. Uh, you show out in your marketplace. And if you're a buyer, you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward when you make an offer because sellers, you know, are going to go with the strongest offer. 
you know, that that uh, you're absolutely right. It's tricky for both buyers and sellers right now, because on the one hand, yeah, if you're a seller, you're probably waiting for lower rates uh, for for equity valuations to go up. If you're a buyer right now, you're probably also waiting for lower rates. But at the same time, if you wait for lower rates, well, in a few years, property values could go up even more. So I if I'm look if I'm looking to buy something right now, I, I have to make the decision. Do I wait for potentially lower rates to lock in or do and and risk paying a bit more or do I just pay whatever it is up front now and uh you know eat up the higher mortgage costs I guess what what do I so do? that well that contemplation skews better towards the buyer than the seller so exponentially as the rates go up the seller park pockets more money which is more meaningful for the seller but it's negligible to the buyer over a you know longer you know mortgage period with a lower rate that lower rate really impacts your payment, you know, over, well, with interest only over the short term and over the long term, you can get interest only rates, you know, much lower than that 30 year fixed rate with the contemplation. And now with the guidance from the Fed that rates will be coming down, the bond market is pricing in a recession. So that's why you're seeing bond rates coming down. That's a flight to safety. So if we do get a bit of a slowdown and bond bonds, you know, keep coming down and mortgage rates are going to keep declining. Um, you know, so it, it, there is a really good opportunity to get an interest only product right now with the thought that rates will come down. Now, that didn't work over the last few years. It actually went the other way. A lot of people bought, you know, with high interest rates over the last couple of years, thinking rates were going to come down quicker than they have. And they're not going to come down immediately overnight. We're, we're seeing it kind of seesaw back and forth, you know, you know in that uh, in that conundrum. But I think the safe bet is to, you know, get get potentially, you know, a creative low interest mortgage through interest only, you know, different types of things. Builders can buy down rates. Sellers can buy down rates. In other words, if there's a $500,000 house, you can say, look, I'll pay you 525, buy my interest rate down. They can buy your interest rate down from, you know, five and a half, six percent down to four and a half, you know, five percent. So those make a bigger difference for the buyer and their payment uh, overall than they do in terms of affordability than they do the seller. Seller might get an extra 20 or 30 by waiting for rates to drop. That'll make a big difference in the buyer's payment in terms of, you know, two hundred dollars a month drop with the interest rates dropping versus, you know, buying now at a higher interest rate. If you're a landlord, how do you see your cap rates changing? So in commercial, you know, we uh, have seen you know cap rates run inverse to interest rates, right? So if interest rates go up, um, or not inverse, but along with, so if interest rates go up, you know, cap rates go up. If interest rates go down, cap rates go down. So they kind of run you know, parallel with interest rates. So we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, cap rates in some markets for some assets are climbing, but, you know, again, sellers are stubborn. And, you know, if the seller doesn't have to sell, they can wait it out. So we've, we, you know, we've seen people holding steady on what they're asking for properties. We've also seen a lot of deals blow up where investors bought over the last few years expecting interest rates to come down. Rates did not come down because that is the market that the Fed affects as the commercial real estate market. And we have not seen, you know, everybody thought the Fed was going to cut for the last three years and they haven't cut, you know. So uh, that's really put a lot of pressure on the commercial real estate market, which has put pressure on cap rates. But you're seeing them start to come down again in, in certain markets. How do you see cap rates changing following the election, um, particularly for landlords who own a lot of units? So this is from this is this is what Kamala Harris said on the campaign trail. She said. On day one, I will take on price gouging and bring down costs. She seems to also back the Biden plan um, from a few weeks earlier uh, to limit rent hikes to 5% nationwide over the next two years for those uh, landlords who own more than 50 units. Um, so there does seem to be a bit more control on rent there from the Biden administration and potentially into the Harris administration, should she win? Um, is this significant for you? No, not necessarily. So you just have to, you know, understand where you're going to buy. You know, there's going to be certain markets where rent controls are going to be a problem. They already are. So that won't affect cap rates. Okay. What that will affect is the value that a property will trade for. So income. You know, commercial properties are based on income, right? So if you have a class A product that's going to trade at a four or five cap, you know, it's going to trade at a four or five cap on that income. So if the income is limited, the value is going to be limited, even though the cap rate doesn't change. Uh, you know, or the thinking could be, well, these markets have rent controls like New York. So obviously you're going to pay, you know, an investor wants a better, you know, higher cap rate because the income 
is limited in that market. But again, it just depends on how competitive that market is, you know, and how competitive the asset is. But, you know, cap rate in and of itself will not be affected by rent control. Only the income will, which affects the value. Values move inversely to cap rate, right? Cap rate goes down, value goes up, cap rate goes up, value comes down. So, you know, um, the cap rate really doesn't have a whole lot to do with those types of things. It's more market and asset driven. Certain assets in certain markets trade at a lower cap rate, whereas certain assets in certain markets will trade at you know a higher cap rate. And even certain assets within the same markets trade at different cap rates. So it's all about location. Real estate is so nuanced and hyper local. But you know, at the end of the day, it's the income that the property value trades for. The cap rate is the yield that that investor is comparing that investment with compared to other risk-free uh, investments like treasuries and bonds and you know things like that. Finally, risks to commercial real estate. We touched on commercial real estate, uh, but let's d deep dive a little bit more. Are there any potential serious headwinds you see facing the real estate market there? So you know that's another one where there's been a lot of crash predictions over the last couple of years, and I've been one that has said over the last two or three years that there is no systemic crash in commercial real estate that could take down the economy like a 2008 and 9. And here's why: it's only a 20 trillion dollar you know market. You know, I mean, the global economy is hundreds of trillions, right, in terms of assets and markets and things like that. So you're talking about a 20 trillion dollar market. Out of that, um, the debt that's coming due over the next several years is about 4.7 trillion. Right now, there's about 500 billion outstanding that's due by the end of the year, meaning it has to be paid off or refinanced. Uh, only 250 billion of it is distressed. So, out of a 20 trillion dollar market, 250 billion is, is distressed. You know, 0.25. Uh, you know, defaults, foreclosures, and distressed sales are all on the rise, but they're on the rise. You know, from from low levels. Right? We we came off a pretty robust commercial real estate market pre-pandemic. So again, a lot of these assets are working their way through the system. The equity is who, get wiped, who, who gets wiped out there. There's been a lot of concern about the shadow banking industry with, you know, um, uh, you know, with, you know, DSCR loans, you know, equity investors, you know, private pensions and life funds that are financing, you know, uh, these properties, the CMBS market. But again, it's just, just such a huge it's such a small piece of a huge global economy that it's not systemic. And it's only isolated to certain assets in certain markets, mostly office, some hotel, some multifamily, but the multifamily assets are trading generally at enough to pay the debt off. You're seeing the office and you're seeing retail um, where the debt holders are having to take a hit. But, you know, again, these are small portions of most of these investors' portfolios, banks, life funds, you know, um, pension funds, things like that. Excellent. Appreciate your update today. Greg, thank you. Where can we learn more from yeah, you? Yeah, gregdickerson.com. That's where all my info is, YouTube channel and everything. And yeah, overall, I'm optimistic. I think the economy's strong. It's going to continue to be strong. I think markets are going to continue to hang in there, you know, as long as we don't have some black swan that pops up like we almost saw a couple of weeks ago, you know, Japanese yen trade unwinding or something like that that's systemic. But, you know, overall, the consumer's strong, the economy's strong, and uh, real estate market is is working its way no, through no, this distress. No major Lehman collapse uh, looming because of um, a major collapse in the housing market is basically what we're talking about here. Way more healthy and you have forbearance, you know. So that's the big thing that's been keeping the economy humming is forbearance everywhere. Housing, auto market, credit, like you can call your lender up and say, look, I can't make my payments. And they'll let you skip three or four payments, six months, whatever. They'll put it on the back of the loan. Very different. 2008, nine. There was no forgiveness. There was no forbearance. They were just foreclosing, taking stuff back, and wiping people out. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Greg. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow Greg in the links down below.